Um, first of all, actually, I have to um, admit that the idea to ask the residents for their career aspirations came from Kelly Nelson and not from me. <laughs> and um, not only with this, but also with many, many other things, she already proved to be a very valuable and creative co-worker. So we now all know um, um, Elaine's um, shoes are very large, but um, you already did a great job. And thank you so much, Kelly, to be with us. So our next speaker, Tony Mai, here he is. Um, he will talk to us, he actually has the longest title. The gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabegolectomy, three to four year outcome data in correlation with preoperative Humphrey visual field and OCT retinal nerve fiber layer scans. And he wanted to become an astronaut or a train driver. <laughs> Take it away. There was actually one more that Dr. Hoffman reminded me. Dr. Hoffman said he wanted to be a um, a garbage disposal man when yeah, he wanted garbage, I mean, garbage. garbage collector. And I had to say that I actually dreamed of that too. So wide variety of things. Let me just pull up my presentation. All right. Do I need to start um, screen share at all back there? All right. So again, my name is Tony. I'm a third year resident here at Moran or PGY3. And we're just going to be looking at some long-term data of the GAP procedure, the gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. And I have no financial disclosures. Today, we'll just be going over first the background of the GAP procedure and why this has led to this current study. Um, what our aims are for this study, the design of it, what we're currently doing and our next steps. And this is because this study I started on just over the past year, we're still just in the process of data collection. And so this is more just of an introductory um, project and presentation where hopefully we'll have some more work to present to you next year. So go, first going over the background of the GAT, what is the GAP um, procedure? And this is a good uh, segue after um, the previous presentation by Cole Swiston. And this procedure was first described just uh, a little over, uh, under a decade ago by Grover in 2014. It is considered a minimally invasive glaucoma procedure. It does fall under that category. And what it does is that it decreases the intraocular pressure of the eye by increasing aqueous outflow. And it does so by cleaving the trabecular meshwork 360 degrees all the way around the angle. This is performed ab interno, and this is um, as compared to ab externo, which is the traditional trabeculotomy approach, and I'll show you a picture of that later. So this ab interno approach is done with the help of a gonioscope, and hence that's why it's in the name. And so how does this work? How does the procedure um, work? We first make small incisions in the cornea and in the trabecular meshwork. Then a suture or a catheter is then threaded into the cornea, into the anterior chamber through that incision we made in the trabecular meshwork into Schlem's canal, and then it's threaded all the way around. And then it's um, grasped with a microforceps once it's threaded through, that's pulled, and then that cleaves the trabecular meshwork. So we'll just be showing some pictures here. Um, this is a video, but I only took some snapshots of the, the video. And this is first a um, keratome making a clear corneal incision. And this is just an animation of the trabecular meshwork with Schlem's canal behind there. So we have to cut through trabecular meshwork in order to access that canal. And so you can see that blade doing that in the angle. Then this is a proline suture. It's being threaded through. And then a microforceps is being used to thread that suture into Schlem's canal through the opening that we made previously. That's another animation. This is not a suture, this is a catheter here that's being uh, put through the canal. That's, and it goes all the way around. And under the gonioscope, you can see how it comes out right around um, where the other suture entered and you can grasp that. And then on the outside, there's another larger forceps. You hold one end, hold on the other, and then it rips through the entire trabecular meshwork. And immediately after that, commonly there is some um, AC hyphema and blood, which a lot of times 
is not a poor indicator. This is a pretty common thing in results. And so how has the GAT procedure performed over the past decade? This is a relatively new procedure, especially with the MIGS revolution. And it's been shown to be pretty comparable to the prior traditional trabeculotomy. And what is the traditional trabeculotomy? Well, for this is an ab external approach. So you're actually going under conjunctiva and under sclera. And there have been many ways described previously. This here um, is a picture showing the use of a trabeculotome, a metal one. And so you would access it ab externo and then work in the um, Schlem's canal and, and in the anterior chamber from the access point. So that's as uh, opposed to our approach now, which is through the cornea and you're not disturbing the conge or the sclera. So the GAT since its inception in 2014 has been shown to be very useful for a wide variety of procedures. There's been an explosion of uh, research showing that it can be used for POAG, primary closed angle glaucoma, congenital glaucoma, uh, juvenile open angle, pseudoax glaucoma, steroid induced, and even uveated glaucoma. So many things this has been found useful for. And what we found through the studies is that there is an IOP lowering of about 35 to 40%, but only while the effects last. So now the question is, how long does the GAT last for? And so we've had a lot of studies going up just to two-year point. And so that's why our project was um, initiated to see, can we get data further than just two years? And um, actually, there was just a recent data or recent study published just earlier this year, having four-year data. And this is actually really interesting. I'll be um, showing in the next slide that the failure rate really starts to climb after the, the, those two years. And so for um, the data, sorry, this got cut off a little bit right there, but uh, for the first study I included from Grover 2014, that's the one that first came out showing one year data after uh, the GAP procedure. Grover then followed up in 2018 having two year data. And the newest study that I found to be really important came out earlier this year by Liu showing four year data after the GAT. And so for the patients whose effect this had lasted for, you can see after one year, it's about 40% IOP lowering, 37 for two years, and still around 46 for four years. So they stayed pretty consistent. And this trend was pretty similar to the number of eye drops that it decreased, 1.1 at one year, 1 1.4 at two years, and 1.0 at four years. But what I found to be very significant is a percent of failure. So over the four years, the percent of failure actually increased all the way up to around 52% of patients. And they had a specific uh, definition of failure that I won't really get into, but it's something like greater than IOP of 21, IOP not being controlled, one single instance of very high IOP. Um, so what we can see here, the trend is that the failure rate goes up to 52% at four years. For those people who it works for, it works well and it stays so. But for those that don't, it, there definitely is this trend going up. And so they included this Kaplan-Meier survival curve here, where you can see um, where there's a sharp increase up in failure over the first six months after the procedure, and that's pretty expected. But then it levels off for a while up around until the two-year mark, and then there's a steady climb for both primary and secondary open angle glaucoma. And so because of these failures, now we're wondering to ourselves. Is there some way we can risk stratify these patients, use their testing to um, figure out if they are a good candidate for this procedure or whether they're gonna fail pretty quickly after we do it? And so two of the most common things that we use is, uh, are the uh, Humphrey visual field testing and the OCT RNFL scan. And so can we take this data, correlate it to their survival rates in terms of the success of this GAT procedure and then see if we can come up with some better idea of who will do well and who won't. And so looking at the pre-op Humphrey visual field, Grover at the two-year data actually did this and was able to show that there was significant increase in failure for eyes with a mean deviation on the Humphrey visual field of uh, worse than negative 15 decibels. And you can see over here that those patients, this is in the dark black line here, had this huge increase all the way up to over 80% failed just at six months. Whereas everyone below that, they did relatively well. 
And so this was a great way to risk stratify these patients. What we um, haven't seen yet is similar data for the RNFL scan. No studies have looked at that. And we use the scan all the time. And especially as these procedures are being done for patients who have more mild um, uh, glaucoma who might not have a lot of findings in their visual fields, this might also be a good way to assess them. And so this leads to our study aims, which is to first extend our follow-up data all the way up to four years, but hopefully even more than that. And just preliminary looking at the data that we're getting back, we have patients all the way from 2015, 16. So this is actually going to be a good amount of follow-up data that we're going to get. And then we're going to try to co correlate their success with the pre-op uh, Humphrey Visual Field and OCT RNFL. So for this follow-up, we're going to be looking at their intraocular pressure, the number of medications they're on, uh, their failure rate, and their reoperation rate. And then for both pre-op Humphrey Visual Field and RNFL, we're going to try to do the similar survival curve over at least four years of data. So for our uh, study design, this is an IRB approved for a retrospective review. The time frame is going to be from the first gap procedure done here at the Moran, so anywhere from around 2012. And we're going to collect data all the way up until this year. Um, the gap procedure, it's going to be performed anywhere through 2019, so at least they'll have four years of follow-up from 2019 till now. For inclusion, we're actually going to be looking at just the adult patients um, who have had uncontrolled IOP, and that's why they needed the procedure. There's a lot of exclusion criteria on here, but over, basically just patients who have good follow-up, who aren't using steroids before or during around the GAT procedure, um, who, don't, who have pretty open angles and don't have any other like big comorbidities um, like neovascular glaucoma. So uh, this is actually a project that we're doing together with Iowa, and we are collecting data from both sites, and we're going to be pulling our data together. And just going over who's involved in the project, so this is led by Dr. Chaya here, and then John Musser and I have been on the project along with two medical students. On the Iowa side, this is Dr. Pau and uh, my friend also at PGY3, uh, Dr. Mansoor. And so currently, we are still just undergoing the data collection. We're actually doing a big revamp of our data collection where I'm actually going back using some more CPT codes to really try to capture more patients, more eyes. And then we're going to be cleaning through the data this summer, hopefully getting analysis in by the end of it, and then writing and submitting by September. And so just acknowledgements here, and I, I apologize, the, um, some of the format here got messed up on the transfer of the PowerPoint, but just to acknowledge everyone involved, um, people I didn't mention yet, Benjamin Brintz, Hunter Fogg, um, who also have been helping with this project. So still a lot to be worked on, and hopefully next year we'll be having some good data to present to everyone about this project. Any questions? Nice job, Tony. Um, I was wondering, I noticed in your inclusion criteria, you mentioned um, uncontrolled IOP is one of the inclusion criteria. Do you guys know yet how you'll define uncontrolled IOP for these patients? Thanks. Um, yes, so it's for patients who are on maximal medical therapy already, and I have to remind myself and look at the paper, but I think it's above 21, um, where they cannot get lower than that with the medications, and therefore they needed to go for the GAT procedure. So, uh, you know, as I, as I remember talking to Alan Crandall about this procedure a long time ago, and I just said, you know, inherently the body doesn't like tearing disruption and it will tend to want to repair it or change it. And repair mechanisms in the eye notoriously are not good. I, I mean, we understand the body does it elsewhere. Uh, I just suggest that uh, because we've got such amazing electron microscopy capabilities with Brian Jones. He's always looking for these unusual. If we get any of these patients in whom we have to go back and reoperate and we can get some area of trabecular meshwork to look to see how it's changed and evolved, because there's really not much in the literature of looking to see what, what down to the ultrastructural level in the fine cellular level, because he's got ways of branding so we can look at what types of cells are there, you know, what the remodeling has occurred I'm almost for sure that's got to be what's happening, yeah. I think. And actually, to this point, in my literature review, 
part of what I found was that there has been some studies, not on the electron level or imaging level at all, but there's been a lot of suspicion that a lot of MIG things, MIGs things fail because of the scarring and remodeling in that area. And so these things just block up again after we tear them open. You know, Schlem's canal surgery is really a relatively new thing that we've been doing. I mean, people knew about Schlem's canal many years ago, but it's only been the last couple of decades that people are looking at Schlem's canal and looking at surgery in the canal itself. Um, Rob Stegman from South Africa was really the modern person who pioneered working Schlem's canal externally, though not internally. But for the residents, if you can find his videos, he's got some amazing videos of putting light devices through Schlem's Canal and putting things through Schlem's Canal. The problem is, is he was working externally and anytime we work externally, it scars even more than internally. So I do think that there's inherent advantages of working internally because you do at least eliminate the scarring that takes place in the sclera and episclera and externally. Any further questions? All right, thank you everyone. Our next speaker is Lydia Sauer, and um, she will talk about retinal vascularization following intravitreal anti-VGF for ROP. And um, when Lydia was young or younger, she's still young, <laughs> um, she wanted uh, to become the anchor woman of the mini playback show. So this was an extremely fancy and renowned television show in Europe. And um, it was actually that there were children who wanted to mimic their stars. Usually these were US stars, of course, Whitney Houston and Madonna. And so there they, they um, put on their clothes, you know, looking like their idols. And then they, they, they did a playback show and mimic um, these superstars. And so she wanted to be the anchor woman. So today the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going to pre present some very new data that I'm actually very excited about ever since I got unmasked about a week ago. And um, I'm going to start with a pomegranate. And I'm not going to start with a pomegranate because the kids that used to be dressed up as stars went through kind of this uh, magic bowl that almost looked like a big pomegranate. But I'm going to start with a pomegranate because at week 22, your baby is going to be about the size of a pomegranate. And the youngest child that is known to survive was born at 20 weeks of gestation. And uh, the incidence of these young children um, that are born prematurely to survive is increasing. And about 11 to 13 percent of pregnancies in the United States uh, end in a premature birth. And birth is considered preterm when the child is born be before 37 weeks of gestation. The survival rates of the very young premature infants is increasing constantly. And that also means that the incidence of retinopathy of prematurity is increasing. And ROP remains a major cause of preventable vision loss in premature children. It occurs in children that are born at 30 weeks or less and with a birth rate of 500 grams or less. And the incidence of ROP in premature infants within the United States has nearly doubled from 4.1% in 2003 to 8.1% in 2019. The treatment of ROP includes laser ablation of the avascular retina, as well as intravitreal injections of anti-VGF agents, specifically bevacizumab. And intravitreal in, uh, anti-VGF was found to be beneficial in the uh, known VTWAP study that was published in 2011, so almost 15, no, over than 15 years ago. And it is still largely unknown how VGF and anti-VGF alters the development of retinal vasculature. So my big research question for this study is, how is retinal vascularization affected by anti-VGF injections? And the hypothesis is that the vascularization of the peripheral retina differs in infants who received an anti-VGF injection compares to those who did not. 
My motivation, as I mentioned before, the incidence of ROP is increasing, and it is poorly understood how anti-VEGF affects uh, the vascular growth in premature infants. And there's really not a lot of quantitative data available to compare the vascularization differences between treated and observed patients. And the goal of this study is really to quantitatively investigate how the retinal vascularization changes or progresses after a single uh, injection of anti-VEGF compared to a group of patients that were observed and did not receive injections or any treatment. This is a retrospective analysis of patients treated at the Moran from 2019 to 2021. All patients were examined and treated by the same pediatric retinal specialist, which is Dr. Hartnett. And we included patients with ROP type 1 that required treatment, and they received a single low dose of intravitreal bevacizumab. And then the control group was a group of closely observed type 2 ROP patients. And all patients needed to have photographs pre and post treatment. And I was a blinded reader and received the identified photos from Mel uh, uh, to kind of investigate the retinal vasculature. The big challenge in the beginning was to find a way on how to reliably uh, analyze these images and find something or find a way to reproducibly get data on the vasculature. So I came up with the idea to choose a marking line on vessel bifurcations, which you can see here as the black line um, that I included in both the posterior pole image as well as the temporal image. And it had to have the same marking points at baseline and follow-up, and those had to be visible in both pictures. And then I measured the vascular extent at a 90 degree angle from the optic nerve to that marking point and from the marking point to the periphery where the vasculature ends. And the same angle was used in all of these pictures at baseline and follow-up. As a control measurement, the optic nerve diameter was uh, an analyzed as well. Pictures that were excluded were uh, images like this, where it is impossible to tell where the vasculature really ends or where it is impossible to find reliable uh, points to set these marks, as well as pictures where at one of the uh, at one of the visits, no optic nerve image was available. And considering that we looked at three years of patients, we were only able to get seven patients that matched our criteria, which was a fairly low number. Um, and we included seven uh, patients that were observed that were birth rate and age matched. Um, there was no significant difference in those two groups between, as I mentioned, birth rate, the week that they were born, the days between the visits that they were analyzed, and the optic nerve size. And initially, I was very skeptical about these numbers, but when I got unmasked and saw that there's a significant difference in a couple of uh, areas, I got a little excited about it. Um, as we expected, the vasculature, the vasculature extent was different, significantly different in the observation versus the treatment group, because the treatment group is zone 1 ROP and the observation group is zone 2 ROP. But surprisingly, the vascular extent or the acceleration of vasculature was much faster in the treatment group at the follow-up visit. And those patients actually caught up in the vascular extent at the uh, at the follow up after treatment. So there was no significant difference in the vascular extent at their second visit. Um, and as shown in this graph here, the difference in the vascular extent is uh, significantly different between those two groups. And it is also different if we kind of divide it by the days in between um, visit one and visit two, we can say that uh, on average, the observation group had an extent of about 14 pixels and the treatment group had an extent of about 52 pixels, which again was significant. This just kind of shows how the vascular extent uh, increased in the treatment and the control group on the left side, and then for each individual patient on the right side, the treatment patients depicted here and the controls over on this side, showing a clear difference between those two groups. Furthermore, we looked at how, or what area of the uh, temporal periphery experienced that growth. So uh, I looked at uh, the area from the optic nerve to the mark versus the area from the marking line 
to the end of the vasculature. And it turns out that uh, the vasculature seems to extend most significantly um, in that area B. Um, uh, oops. Uh, that's what, uh, here's the difference in the, in the table. Uh, so in area B um, is where the vascular growth happens. Um, and that's also where we can see a significant difference between visit one and visit two in observation versus treatment group. And this is depicted again uh, in this chart. Finally, we also looked at vertical changes, and it's a little bit dif more difficult to uh, assess how the vertical diameter is changed um, over time. But since we have the marking line with known points that we looked at, um, we were wondering if the marking lines changed at all. And there was actually a decrease in the marking line that was significant for the observation group, but not significant in the treatment group. Um, but there was no significant difference uh, between the two groups overall. So what that means is that the vertical diameter got slightly smaller, which might be just the normal growth of the eye. Um, but this did not uh, have any relation to whether or not patients got anti-VGF injections. So in discussion, there are a couple of laboratory studies that have shown that anti-VGF has a favorable effect on the vessel elongation in the retina. And uh, that is thought to be due to the fact that anti-VGF causes a favorable orientation of the endothelial mitosis cleavage planes. And those are responsible for the elongation of vessels. And there's also a clinical study, the only one that really showed quantitative data that showed that in patients who had received intervitreal bevacizumab, the increase in temporal retinal vascularization was greatest at the short-term visit at 7.3 weeks and less at the long-term visit. But those patients were again not compared to control groups. In terms of long-term follow-up for these patients, there are no adverse side effects medically or neurode neurodevelopmentally um, that were found for the patients treated in the BTWAP study or in other studies that also looked at long-term follow-up for these patients. There's one big discussion going on about peripheral avascular retina, which is frequently found in patients that have ROP and it often requires additional treatment. However, a study that looked at patients who were screened for ROP and did not receive treatment with anti-VEGF, 91% of these patients also had avascular retina. So this is something that's likely not related to the anti-VEGF injections, but related to ROP itself. However, future studies are really needed to investigate the long-term effects of anti-VGF and what it does to the vasculature of the babies. But in conclusion, um, this study found that the vasculature length increases with anti-VGF injections, and the increase in healthy retinal vasculature is really accelerated with one single dose or low dose of bevacizumab, and that the patients actually catch up with the controls um, at their one-week follow-up with only that one single injection. So what might be the case is that regulating abnormally increased VGF signaling may promote the physiological vascular development, and future prospective studies would be needed um, to kind of quantify this effect for longer-term follow-up intervals. Here are my references, and with that, I would like to thank especially Dr. Emmy Hartnett, who is really the brains behind a lot of this, and um, I think uh, this study is kind of a proof of concept, clinical proof of concept of a lot of her laboratory work, up, uh, work that she has published. And then also Mel, who uh, got a lot of these images for us, Maria, Maria Margarita and Dr. Jacoby. And thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much for this very impressive data. Um, Dr. Hoffman. Yeah, this is great work. You know, the more we hear things like this, the more I realize that we don't understand everything we need to understand about ROP because from a clinical standpoint, concerns about failure to develop peripheral vasculature and recurrence of ROP has been the big thing that leads to many of these children, particularly those that come to us from disparate areas, Montana, Northern Wyoming, getting laser treatment prior to discharge. But you're also showing that there is increased vascular development. Putting those together is, is, is going to be key. This is really good work. Very impressive. Thank and uh, 
you know, I mean, in my practice career, I've seen things go from kids with severe ROP were simply sent to the blind school. There was no treatment. And then we had cryo, had laser, various uh, anti-VEGF treatments, and all the subtleties of that are being sorted out. This is, this is good work and look forward to good things from you. Thank you so much. I think the benefit of using anti-VGF injections might also be that if the vasculature, the healthy vasculature increases, um, patients could see in those areas versus as they were, if they receive early laser, those areas would be visual field defects. So I think uh, investigating whether even the children from like Northern Idaho who take hours to come here, whether they would benefit from a single injection and then doing laser if it fails to develop further, uh, might be a good point of thought. Absolutely. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, our next speaker, Nanan Amakiri. And um, he is talking about leveraging the site outcomes research collaborative repository, also the source repository, to identify patients with RPGR related retinitis pigmentosa. And um, you wanted to become a teacher and a basketball coach. Sure. Um, I think, you know, being a physician allows you to, to, to do the teaching component. and. Uh, luckily for me, uh, having uh, you know Jordan in my in my class, I think there's still hope to to coach him up and and be that basketball coach in the future. So, uh, so like she said, the uh, title of my pre presentation today is, is called "Leveraging the Sites Outcomes a Research Collaborative Repository to Identify Patients with RPGR Related Retinitis Pigmentosa." Uh, thankfully, we've kind of already touched on this briefly. Uh, Dr. Etheridge did a fantastic job of uh, uh, laying the groundwork, and, and Dr. Stagg uh, added some comments as well. But I'll, I'll, I'll specifically talk about how it uh, has helped us with uh, this specific inherited retinal disease. And so just a brief overview on retinitis pigmentosa. It's the most common uh, cause of inherited blindness in the U.S. Uh, affects about uh, one and a half million people worldwide uh, with a prevalence of one in 3,000 to one in 5,000 per year. Uh, it's, a, it's clinically and genetically diverse um, with uh, inherited retinal disease, uh, predominantly affecting rods uh, with later degeneration of cones. It can be also more recessive, dominant, or X-linked, and its inheritance pattern correlates with the disease severity. And so on to some of the symptoms that we, that we typically see in this uh, uh, disease. Because it's rod uh, predominant, uh, you can have nyctalopia or, or, or night vision issues, uh, as well as tunnel vision. Uh, and, but later on, you'd start to notice some phot photopsias, photophobia, and gradual onset of vision loss. Uh, so in terms of the classic uh, findings what we get tested on and, and, and one might see, uh, in the periphery, you can see clumps of pigment uh, dispersed in a pattern that's been uh, previously expressed as a, a bone spicule retinal pigmentation. I'll be honest, before uh, uh, this project, I had no idea what a bone spicule was. I think still afterwards, I'm still not sure how it correlates, uh, but here's uh, an image uh, that I found online and, and, and what we typically see on a fundus photograph. So hopefully, maybe someone can make that connection for me. Um, and please reach out uh, if you can. Uh, other findings you might see are arteriolar attenuation, uh, optic, optic disc pallor, uh, commonly described as waxy. Uh, you can also see vitreous cell, uh, retinal pigmentary epithelium changes, as well as posterior subcapsular cataracts uh, being a, a fairly common complication of this disease. Uh, in terms of additional findings, uh, specifically with uh, uh, female car carriers that are symptomatic, uh, the periphery changes are commonly described as mild. And that's what the top uh, from this photograph is supposed to be, uh, which was a little bit more zoomed out. I apologize for that. Um, and then the bottom one's uh, it's specifically focusing on the macula. So it's commonly described as a tapetal or tapetal uh, reflex that we can see in canines. Um, here is a picture of a tapetum. Um, and kind of the same thing uh, presents, but I think I can better hallucinate here and, and see how this might uh, <laughs> correlate a little bit better. So in terms of the causes of retinal, retinitis pigmentosa, it's, it's due to mutations in rhodopsin protein genes. 
the most common and severe form of which uh, is, is the RPGR related uh, X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. About 10 to 20% of cases in our, uh, RP is uh, uh, X-linked, 70% uh, of which is uh, localized to mutations at the RPGR gene. And uh, because OCAPS is 330 days away, I just thought I would <laughs> put, put a picture, make sure everyone's prepared of uh, uh, some of the, <laughs> the differential diagnosis for retinitis pigmentosa. I won't go into to, to much detail here, but I just wanted to, to show you how broad it can be uh, in terms of that diagnosis. So there's multiple modalities with which we can utilize to, to better assess uh, and, and track these patients. Uh, full field ERGs is particularly sensitive. Uh, early on, it can show scotopic changes, so uh, reduced A and B waves, uh, and eventually it can uh, become undetectable. Uh, you can use a DA, uh, an EOG, which uh, helps you look at uh, specifically RPE abnormalities. Uh, this will be subnormal, or uh, you won't see a light rise in this uh, specific disease pattern. Uh, visual fields will commonly show mid-peripheral scotomas that eventually will coalesque uh, and ultimately leading to this tiny central island division. And that's because of the rapid changes, uh, rapid expansion outward and kind of slower uh, expansion inward. We also can utilize uh, like an OCT, look for macular edema, uh, and of course, uh, uh, genetic testing to confirm the, the presence of the disease. And in terms of treatment, uh, currently there's no approved treatment for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, but there are, or retinitis pigmentosa in general, but there are uh, some new exciting potential therapies on the horizon. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges with studying and expanding this is, uh, upon this is uh, the fact that uh, there aren't ICD-10 billable codes uh, for retinitis pigmentosa. So uh, it's hard to get a large enough uh, population size to really dive into research, whether it be, uh, uh, finding the correct patient population to do gene therapy on or uh, just looking to the disease in general. And then, of course, there are symptomatic treatments for cataracts or uh, just low vision in general that will pop up in these patients often very early. And so I kind of briefly touched on this, but the question uh, back in, how do we expand our research capabilities? Uh, how do we better attack therapies in the future? Uh, it's not as complicated as chess. Uh, I think that one of the first steps we need is just to, to, to increase our sample size. And of course, uh, here's a picture of two of our student residents uh, uh, playing chess. So the objective of my specific research was again, to leverage that new uh, repository uh, source uh, to obtain a better appreciation of the demographics, uh, uh, the clinical findings, and, and really a patient's journey uh, with their disease and, and the disease process. On to materials and methods. So what is source? Uh, it's a consortium of academic ophthalmology centers utilizing the same EHR, uh, submitting de-identified data um, uh, from these various institutions. Again, we can capture demographics, we can capture exam findings, uh, we can capture diagnoses, uh, procedures, labs, surgeries, medications. Uh, of course, uh, like Dr. Stagg mentioned earlier, we're not capturing, we're not seeing the full chart, we're not seeing the full progress uh, notes or report. And this is from multi, uh, uh, a variety of different centers. So uh, it's going to be very different with which, in terms of the visual fields we're using and, and, and a whole bunch of other different things. But the source allows us to essentially clean, aggregate this data uh, to better uh, harmonize it and use it for research and quality improvement projects in the future. Uh, and so this is a graphic just to show you which sites are currently involved. So about 12 or 13 sites are currently active and that's depicted on the right. And then all the sites that are either planning or in the process of becoming involved on the left. So right now there's about 4 million uh, patients in that repository. Uh, and the patients specifically I'm gonna present on today are actually from about three or so of the sites uh, that are currently active. So the number, uh, well, actually I'll discuss that later. And so in terms of the methods, uh, once again, it's de-identified data. So I'm just, this slide is really just to show you an example of, of, of that chart review that we did uh, specifically at the Moran Eye Center. Uh, on the left, we just have an ERG, uh, again, removing patient uh, data on the same thing on the right with the visual field. All right, and then in terms of results, so uh, actually before I dive into that, we, I wanna uh, describe a little bit more about how we uh, classified our patient population. Uh, so we had four main categories. The first of which is uh, definite cases, which are males with the uh, clinical phenotype, 
uh, as well as uh, RPGR confirmed genetic testing. And I really want to focus on that in particular. It's incredibly important for us. Uh, it can really help us narrow down um, any variability that is really inevitable with small sample sizes. Uh, so effectively, we can increase our power in future studies by increasing this specific portion of our data set. Um, uh, probable cases include males with perhaps the clinical phenotype and a uh, um, relative with uh, RPGR confirmed uh, retinitis pigmentosa, and it needs to also be consistent with an X-linked uh, pattern of inheritance, or males with clinical phenotypes and uh, uh, reported uh, genetic uh, testing that confirmed uh, RPGR, but we just didn't have access to that currently. Uh, and then possible cases are when we had males with uh, the phenotypes, um, but a variant of unknown significance. And in terms of symptomatic uh, carriers, it's kind of self-explanatory, but uh, essentially females that were uh, uh, confirmed to be symptomatic carriers either by genetic testing or uh, 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 X-linked, someone in the family uh, having the same pedigree and, and, and testing. And so uh, one of the focal points and perhaps the most important uh, kind of thing that my specific research is touching on is the fact that uh, in, even in our infancy, uh, the source that we were able to, uh, the patient that we were able to, to accumulate really does do a good job of, uh, as compared to recently published literature on XLRP. So we found that it stacks up very favorably to any single center capability. And I just included this for absolutely no reason. I'll continue. Uh, further on with the results, uh, for demographics, the majority of which were uh, non-Hispanic white individuals, about 2 to 4% fit in other racial demographics. Uh, we had about 8% unknowns or undisclosed. Uh, moving on, I kind of touched on this briefly before, but clinical management varies across all these sites. And then at first, I thought that was a limitation, but I really just think that's a result in general. Uh, there's no... Uh, uh, clear uh, distinguishing factor to say that it's a limitation quite yet. It can actually be a benefit depending on uh, maybe what quality improvement factors that we end up finding from this. Uh, not every patient underwent the same assessment. So uh, as we all know, visual fields can be quite different from uh, uh, center to center. So the, the specific visual field is gonna be different. The type of visual field might be different, et cetera. Uh, this is just a figure showing the age at first uh, eye encounter. Uh, that was fairly consistent uh, between the different types of patients we had. So around 25 years old. And then we had a figure showing the visual acuity at the first eye visit, as well as the most recent eye visit. Uh, this is a, a difficult, uh, I think, figure overall because we're not showing, uh, well, patients were not seeing that over the same time period, right? So uh, uh, it's not really going to encompass whether or not we have a patient who uh, was seen five times or over the span of five years or uh, 10 years, et cetera. But uh, as expected, it's showing that visual acuity does worsen with time. And that can be, again, confounded by a whole variety of different things. We talked about uh, PSEs, we talked about uh, other complications that one can expect from uh, just aging. Uh, and then this is specific to the Moran Eye Center comparing RPGR related uh, retinitis pigmentosa uh, as to uh, RP2. Uh, at the Moran, our, our goal is to really replicate this research that we did use with source and see how it compares to our specific patient population. Uh, about 90% of these patients uh, were male, 90% uh, of which were also had the RPGR mutation. In green, we see the combination of both RPGR and RP2. Blue is the RPGR, and then the red is that RP2 uh, mutation. Um, the average age was very similar across both the groups, uh, but specifically when it came to the average age at legal blindness, represented on the right-hand side, uh, you could see that RP2 patients became legally blind a lot sooner uh, than RPGR patients. And this is just one of those data points that we can kind of look at, examine, and I think uh, source gives us that opportunity to, to uh, explore more. So ultimately, uh, SOURCE is a novel database that uh, offers comprehensive clinical data uh, for rare disease populations like those with XLRP, but also like glaucoma and a variety of different studies, as, as Dr. Stagg and uh, Dr. Etheridge mentioned earlier. Um, without specific ICD-10 billing codes, uh, it really can be difficult to locate these patients and other data sets. So this is the, the huge advantage with uh, SOURCE and, and multi-centered studies in general. Uh, it, once again, Permits us the, or provides us the opportunity to uh, really better understand um, uh, XLRP compared to other 
the genetic phenotypes, uh, et cetera. And so I wanted to acknowledge uh, some of the people who helped make this research possible, uh, starting with the research to prevent blindness in New York, uh, the Carl and Joan Mosk family, uh, Janssen or Johnson Johnson Company, as well as the ARCS Foundation. And further acknowledgments include uh, Dr. Joshua Stein at Michigan, uh, Drs. Barbara Wasco and Brian Stagg here, and uh, spe special thanks to our medical students who did uh, a ton of uh, chart review and, and a ton of really hard work. Uh, Dennis Jensen, a third year medical student here, and, and Taylor Johnson, a second year medical student here. And the picture above is, is, is a presentation at Arvo. Uh, I, was, I was fortunate enough to present this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Alrighty, any questions? This is probably a question more for uh, Dr. Stagg. Are you Brian? I, I know that these big uh, data sets have to be de-identified in order to use them. Is it possible to pierce that and then identify who these individuals are? Uh, I'm just thinking of ways that, because often our problem has to do with numbers, you know, not having enough in different yeah. data set to be able to do really detailed analyses. And, and if you can go back and identify, for instance, any of our Utah group, uh, almost for sure you can get them in the Utah population database and start getting pedigrees and others. And, and I'm just, so I'm just curious, or it, yeah. in order to make it as usable, it, you really, this data is de-identified. So um, that's a good question. I've, I've actually gone through like a few different things with that. Like, like this, like getting this data has been a huge process. Like I, I started working on this in 2019 and we're just like getting the data now. It's like, you know, Christmas finally came and, uh, but so we're, we'd like to do a link so that we could reverse it. So right now, so we know all of our patients. We, so it's not a huge issue for this. We know who our, who our patients are. But for future work, we're, right now, once we send it, from there, you can't go back to gotcha. our data. And that, that's how we've set it up. We're, we're working with like our, uh, our institutional uh, you know, legal and advisors here. We'd like to create a link so that potentially we could go backwards. Um, so we're working on that. But right now, once we send it, it's completely de-identified. But we do know all of our, for these patients, we, we would be able to connect them with the Utah, Utah population database. But yeah, no, it brings- For studies though, too, as well. You know, you, you, you have these, you say, what if we could do X? That may be helpful. And if you can't go back and, and for many of the areas, it may not be that easy, indeed, if they if it's totally de-identified. So I'm just yeah. I know I know that it's the pluses and minuses and the privacy and all of the others. And, yeah. But I I think in the end it would be really safe because we would keep that on a secure thing. So someone would have to like hack the data in Michigan, and then independently hack our system, and by that point they would have hacked a lot more stuff that would be a lot more useful. Right. And so I think. <laughs> Like, I think that- uh, like, like, like credit card numbers. Yeah, exactly. Like that. So I think, that, I think that we'll be able to get approval for it. And it'll be, our plan is to keep it like, uh, behind, like behind an IRB firewall, you know? So you'd have to have an IRB to use that reverse link. And we'd have to demonstrate, you know, the, the normal IRB things, like the patients would get a benefit from it. They'd have an, and so I think it would be really safe. It's just a matter of uh, getting approval on that. And so I'm, I'm working through that process. So if you support it, that's really helpful. You, too. You've got my support. <laughs> okay. I guess just a quick comment on that. Uh, so that is one of the goals for at least Janssen's involvement with this. Uh, they want to essentially find a, the, the right patient population to uh, start a lot of these tr uh, clinical trials and, and gene therapy. So ultimately, it would be hugely beneficial for uh, future studies to to be able to to work our way backwards. We can easily do that with the Moran Eye Center data that we have, uh, but uh, especially when this uh, grows and really expands, uh, if we find out a, a, a critical time period with which we want to perform gene therapy in the future, it'd be great if we can work our way back and uh, you know find those patients to to get them involved. Hey Nana, I'm sorry if you yes. mentioned this at the beginning, but um, if you take your garden variety X-linked RP patient, what percent of them have that RPGR mutation? Yeah, so uh, 60 to 70 percent, at least uh, in some of the literature I was looking at, 60 to 70 percent of uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa was uh, RPGR. Um, so it was the most common and also the most severe form, of course, as well. 
Um, and so it's uh, significant enough for us to, to, to hopefully find enough data and, and make a huge impact in the future, um, uh, you know, given the, the processes that we talked about earlier. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. And I do not only see a huge value for um, rare diseases, but also for, you know, certain subtypes of age-related macular degeneration and response to upcoming therapies in dry AMD. So, Brian, thank you so much for this initiative. I think we can all benefit a lot from this. Okay, so our next speaker is Jordan Desautels. I'm sorry, I, I certainly pronounced it wrong. <laughs> and uh, Jordan will uh, talk about orbital implants receiving pre-market approval. And I very much like what you wanted to be when you was young. You wanted to be a street crossing guard. This is solid, this is reliable, and I think these are the most important characteristics. Is this lapel mic working? I'm debuting the lapel for biomechanical reasons. Okay, um, so hi, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about orbital implants that uh, receive uh, FDA pre-market approval or what we call FDA pre-market notification. Um, as you'll see in the title, I was going to originally talk about another case series um, on awakening ptosis, but uh, it was a little busy, so we're just going to talk about orbital implants today. Um, so this is a project that was published in the Ophthalmic Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery in the fall of this year. I worked on this with a mentor from medical school, Dr. Migliori, um, and I'd be remiss not to mention Dr. Corcoran Ruiz, who's a resident at the University of Pennsylvania, who spearheaded a lot of the efforts for this project. And this study is really more qualitative than anything, but I think it's a useful background for us as ophthalmologists as we interact with technology daily. We're in a high technological use field. We put in a lot of implants and things like that. So. Um, it's a kind of an insight into how these devices are brought to market and some of the potential inherent flaws in that process. And I will specifically talk about that process with respect to orbital implants. So um, I'll start off talking about kind of just some background on how the FDA classifies medical devices and the FDA clearance or approval pathways that are relevant to those different classes. Um, and then I will discuss some pitfalls of this system and present data from the US marketing of orbital implants that showcases some of these pitfalls. So the class that the FDA designates to a medical device before it is considered um, able to be marketed in the United States is based on both intended use, but also indications for use. So class one devices, for example, band-aids um, with only some exceptions are subject to a series of controls that we call general controls. These are just basic production and safety guidelines that apply to all US marketed medical devices. Then class two devices, uh, for example, orbital implants, and a vast majority of the devices that we use every day in ophthalmology um, are given a designation of, quote, FDA cleared through something called the 510K pathway. Um, and there's also some nuance to that, which I'll discuss in a moment. Um, but one specific exception that is given to class two devices is called the pre-amendment exception, um, which allows any device that was marketed before 1976, when the FDA passed the Medical Device Amendments Act, to essentially be given grandfather status. So it never had to undergo additional clinical testing to actually remain on the market. So if you were selling an orbital implant in 1975, you were allowed to continue marketing that device without any additional approval after 
the passage of this act. And then class three devices, of course, such as pacemakers, these are high risk products. They have life sustaining functions um, and they require rigorous clinical studies showing safety data prior to being placed on the market. And at the end of that process, they are given the designation of FDA approved. So when you hear FDA approved, that is the result of a actual safety trial. So I'll talk a little bit more about the 510K clearance pathway, also known as pre-market notification. Um, and this is a notification that is essentially filed by a company to the FDA at least three months in advance of marketing a device that allows the FDA to, to determine if the device you are trying to sell is what they call substantially equivalent to a device that is already on the market, so-called predicate device. So substantial equivalence itself means that the characteristics of the new device that you're trying to bring to market are deemed similar enough to the characteristics of a predicate device as to be considered safe to market without any additional testing. There's no additional safety testing. And this is really the only real way you could bring a product to market. And it's a good thing because if you had to do a clinical trial every single time, you wanted to make an iterative improvement on a new orbital implant or any new device, um, you would essentially get nowhere in terms of bringing devices to patients. The time expenditure would just be unacceptable. But there are several inherent flaws with the 510K system. And in our study, we essentially demonstrate this by looking at orbital implants brought to market. But the logic holds essentially for any product that we use uh, on a daily basis. So the first problem is that an orbital implant can be cleared and deemed substantially equivalent to a pre-1976 device that was not subjected to any safety data and was sort of just grandfathered in. Um, and the second is that you can prove substantial equivalence by being compared to a device that was also cleared by being substantially equivalent to a device prior to it. And there's no limitation on how many generations that can go back. So the original predicate device that was actually studied and approved may be so many generations removed from the product at hand as to be you know, really unapplicable. Um, and if at any point in that chain of substantial equivalence claims, if one of those products is determined to be flawed, has complications, has safety issues, and is pulled off the market, there is no formalized process by which subsequently cleared devices that were substantially equivalent to that device undergo review. So they are essentially remaining on the market having been cleared by being substantially equivalent to a device that is now not allowed to be marketed in the United States anymore. So what we did is we actually utilized the FDA's publicly available 510K pre-market notification database for all FDA cleared orbital implants going back to the law's inception in 1976 to try to trace these chains of substantial equivalence as best we could. And ultimately, we identified 29 orbital implants brought to market over this time period. And only nine of those implants, so about a third anywhere in that available pre-market application, um, even list a predicate device anywhere in their market application. So a lot of that is actually done behind closed doors with the FDA. And a total of four of 29 of these orbital implants were recalled for various safety reasons like extrusion, infection, um, rates that were considered unacceptable. And of those nine, and only nine of those implants, like I said, listed a predicate device. Of those nine implants that did list a predicate device, three of them were cleared by being deemed substantially equivalent to an orbital implant that was subsequently recalled. It was taken off the market. And 
those implants essentially just remain free floating being put in orbits all over the United States. Um, so kind of some of our conclusions, while none of the orbital implants with a recall predicate device went on to be recalled, at least thus far, um, when you see these late night commercials of, you know, have you or a loved one had an abdominal mesh that extruded through your abdomen, those kinds of things, that this is how that happens is through this kind of series of substantial equivalence claims. Um, and it's really shocking when we went through all the data, only 1% of devices that you see on the market today are actually FDA approved, meaning that they undergo clinical safety trial data. And um, these labels that say FDA cleared may give false confidence both to consumers, but also to doctors who are using these products every day. And you're going to put in an implant and you say this is FDA cleared, well, that may not be as meaningful as you have originally thought. Um, so some positive things. In 2022, the FDA passed an act, um, which is called the Medical Device User Fee Act. And they essentially tighten the definition of substantial equivalence. And they put in a post-market studies program called the 522 program specifically for class two devices like the ones we use today, um, where essentially devices that get flagged in some way, either through clinical trial data or through uh, public comment data um, can be subject to additional controls and require additional approval and regulation. Um, but this has yet to be applied to any orbital implant currently on the market. Um, and so just I'll, I'll finish here with just a small public service announcement. If you are noticing complications with devices um, that seem to be disproportionate maybe to what is published in the literature or um, is being claimed by a company, the FDA has a public database called MedWatch where doctors and patients can essentially report safety issues. And then that allows for this flagging process and some post-market regulation to essentially occur. Um, and thank you for your time. I'll take any questions. So my career goes back to a time when there was no Devices Act and it wasn't a drug, you could essentially do anything. And we had people making intraocular lenses in their garages and putting it inside a vice to a uh, disastrous impact. So, uh, and the Devices Act largely occurred because two companies using what's called wet sterilization, in which you use sodium hydroxide to have the lens sterilized, and then you would put it in bicarbonate of soda afterwards to, uh, you know, to make it safer than rinse it. Their bicarbonate of soda in one case had a fungal infection through all of them and caused devastating impact. That was one of my first papers I wrote about that series. And right after that, another company had their uh, sodium, you know, bicarbonate of soda contaminated pseudomonas. You can imagine how that went. And those two caused the outcry that resulted in the Devices Act. But you point out the very real holes that exist. And there's always this cry about the fact that, you know, we're, we're too restrictive. But even though I think at times it is too difficult when you're doing the full formal process, that the loopholes that still exist today cause problems that would otherwise be avoidable. Thank you. Wonderful talk. I am wondering, and I'm not as familiar with that, um, how many of the ocular implants that we implant at the Moranai Center are FDA cleared versus FDA approved? And do you know if there's a price difference between those? Um, I'm not sure if there's a price difference. All the orbital implants that we use at the Moran, as far as I'm aware, are FDA cleared. So like the MedPOR, for example, um, those are those all came through the 510K uh, program rather than 
initial clinical trial data. How about if you have a device that is delivering um, medication? It, does that fall under medications or the devices like the, the insertable steroid? Oh, uh, yeah, I'll do that. Something like that. I'm, I would imagine that that would, I don't know exactly. I would imagine it fall under. That, so they can't hear you online really quick. I'm going to let Deborah, our resident expert, make a comment, summarize any comments that were made today. But I, I will just say that, um, you know, uh, something like a, a drug delivery device the implant um, is regulated as a combination product, as Dr. Hoffman said, but they're held to the drug um, standards um, for their uh, FDA trials rather than the device clearance. Yeah. And just for those online, that was Deborah Harrison. Would you tell us your, your full title, if you would, as well? <laughs> yes, my full title is Associate Director of Research. Associate Director of Research, just, just for those who haven't met her yet. And Dr. Warner, a little bit more to your point. So it, it, is, it is both contingent upon the intended use, but also the indication, kind of what if you have to be cleared or approved through a study. So if the intended use of a scalpel, say, is to make an incision, that might give you one class designation. But if the indication for use, what you actually put on the label is to make corneal incision, then that will upclassify you and re require you to undergo more formalized safety trial data. If anyone wants the lapel, this is this is nice. Thank you so much. Our next speaker, Mubarak Mohamed, and he will talk about systemic review of the diagnostic approach to non glaucomatous optic atrophy. And when he was young, he wanted to become a professional soccer player. I get this. I have two boys in this age. One wants to be a professional soccer player. The other one, a professional basketball player. Um, I still hope that. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, the title of my uh, talk today is a systemic review of the diagnostic approach uh, to non glaucoma uh, optic atrophy. And this is kind of uh, born out of uh, both kind of being on the neuro ophthalmology service and then, you know, with glaucoma, um, a lot of the referrals are for. Uh, kind of these atypical cases of glaucoma where uh, they don't have kind of, you know, the family history, you know, the IOP is kind of normal, maybe normal setting for glaucoma, and then the visual fields are a little abnormal. So um, very common uh, as far as kind of this patient population and uh, very commonly seen in neuro-ophthalmology. Uh, so just a little bit of a background. Uh, it's the most uh, glaucoma optic neuropathy is the most commonly acquired um, optic neuropathy encountered in clinical practice. Uh, by definition, it's a progressive uh, optic um, neuropathy characterized by typical changes in the optic nerve head, including a large uh, vertical cup to disc ratio, neuroretinal rim loss, disc hemorrhages, uh, and that correlate with uh, visual field loss as far as the RNFL uh, defects. Uh, although elevated intraocular pressure uh, is the most important risk factor for glaucoma, a significant portion of patients uh, may present with a normal IOP, and I'm sure that was kind of all a same question that we're asked in medical school as far as like, what's the actual definition of glaucoma? Um, as such, a definitive diagnosis is not always simple, um, and it's not straightforward because elevated intraocular pressure uh, is not a criteria uh, for diagnosis, and there's a high possibility of misdiagnosing uh, various uh, non glaucoma optic neuropathies. Uh, you know, the kind of differential is, is very broad as a lot of the, uh, I guess, PGY2 uh, first-year residents know working in our uh, neuroophthalmology clinic. So uh, kind of uh, the main one is, you know, not missing kind of an extrinsic compression, but certainly a congenital optic neuropathies such as dominant and recessive optic atrophy, Lebers, uh, and heteroretinal dystrophies as well can also present as an optic neuropathy such as RP and uh, kind of Nana's talk. Uh, certainly intrinsic uh, tumors such as optic nerve gliomas, extrinsic compression, vascular disease uh, such as ischemic optic neuropathy, inflammatory disease, toxicity, detritional deficiency, trauma, 
Uh, just a lot of to unpack, and I'm sure uh, certainly I've been in the case where you know you're presenting to an attending, and you always seem to miss one of these, and they always get it right. So, um, let's see if I can go back here. Uh, in the current literature, there are varying opinions uh, in the utility of uh, neurological and neuroophthalmic uh, evaluation of atypical glaucoma or unexplained uh, optic atrophy. Um, certainly, from kind of our research, uh, you know, there's been kind of uh, over the years, uh, certainly, like I think Andy Lee has published uh, several articles looking at this utility as far as a, a laboratory and neuroimaging workup. Uh, several folks out in uh, Israel as well have pro uh, produced some results, which uh, are a little mixed. Some folks, you know, advocate for a kind of an extensive laboratory workup. Other folks, uh, other folks, uh, you know, say more so just kind of get a brain scan and make sure that you don't uh, rule out a or you rule out a, a, a tumor or compression. Um, but with these varying opinions in regards to the imaging and the laboratory evaluation. Uh, this highlights the need for a directed approach in regards to their initial diagnostic evaluation. And certainly this is a um, kind of a, a, a uh, need for uh, such research in, in the literature because it's lacking. Uh, so I did not realize that uh, prior to starting residency that you have kind of a year by year contract. And I just recently renewed my contract for PGY3. <laughs> And thank you, Dr. Simpson and Dr. Petty, for letting me stay at least one more year. Um, but uh, one thing I also realized is, you know, systemic literature reviews take a while. Uh, you know, I was someone told me like twelve to eighteen months, and then working with the uh, the uh, librarian and, and and kind of the folks at Apple Health Sciences. Uh, so certainly, my research project is not completed in this sense, but I felt like it was a good opportunity to, at least for the junior residents and some of the uh, other residents here, to uh, kind of go over a systemic literature review and. Uh, how to kind of go about it in a kind of a uh, literally a systemic uh, way uh, so you can kind of get the answer that you would like. Uh, so as far as kind of a basic definition, it's a rigorous and structured uh, approach to identifying and analyzing and synthesizing all available research evidence. Uh, the goal is to provide uh, a comprehensive and uh, most notably an unbiased uh, summary of the existing evidence of a particular topic. And this includes retrieving and identifying all relevant studies, assessing their quality, and then most importantly, uh, synthesizing the results to draw conclusions. Uh, there are all several steps, and um, I'll be brief and not bore you too much, but it is important to just kind of go over um, uh, kind of a, 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 this is kind of the consensus 10-step process that I've at least seen in uh, the Cochrane Review. And the first half is just obvious. Um, have a research question, uh, develop a review protocol. Uh, develop the review protocol involves uh, creating a detailed review of um, protocol that outlines uh, methodology and procedures to be followed and includes defining inclusion exclusion criteria for the studies, uh, search strategies as well, that extraction methods, analysis techniques. Uh, certainly the literature search also involves using a comprehensive or relevant database. Uh, most often people use things we're aware of such as uh, PubMed, um, Web Science and Scopus. Uh, and then certainly uh, the data extraction uh, part is obvious. And then in terms of quality assessment, uh, each uh, systematic review has to include, um, is, is, is assessed for uh, the quality and the risk of bias. Uh, there are various tools and checklists that are used to evaluate the study designs and methodology and potential sources of bias, as well as the reliability of, of the results. Um, and then in terms of uh, publication bias and sensitivity analysis, uh, the potential for publication bias where positive or statistically significant um, results are more likely to be published is also assessed. Um, in our uh, kind of uh, initial assessment, we work with the folks at the uh, Eccles uh, Health Sciences Library in, in University of Utah. Um, I did not know what kind of a library uh, specialist did. It was kind of when I explained that I was going to ophthalmology for my mom, like she was just quizzical, like all the all that training for just the eyes, like you couldn't learn anything else. <laughs> And then I told her like, um, yeah, what a waste, like four years. And then I told her I was interested in fellowship. I was like, interested in cornea or anterior segment. They're like, for four years, you're studying the eyes and you can't learn anything else. Um, but uh, it's the same way, like, you know, as, as we kind of talked about with systemic, uh, the systematic review, it's, it's very complex. You certainly, it's a very regimented approach. These folks, you know, go to school and uh, have, you know, very, very advanced degrees to, um, to kind of uh, formulate, uh, you know, these questions that, or help us formulate these questions and kind of uh, go about it the right way as far as uh, making an unbiased uh, review of the available literature. So I just wanted to shout out uh, uh, Mary uh, at the Echoes Health Sciences uh, 
uh, library who's helping us uh, perform this literature review and uh, kind of collating the data. Um, it's going to be kind of an extensive process. I said it's about you know a year and a half to kind of fully complete. Um, but just wanted to let you guys know that's available resource and those folks are very smart and very good at what they do. Um, this is just kind of a, a template uh, as far as the protocol. Um, it's called the Diagnostic Text Accuracy and uh, it's literally, uh, it's very nice. It's, it's a protocol in the sense where you just kind of fill out all the uh, required information. And um, as a researcher, your goal is to not only come up with the research question as far as uh, the participants and index testing and, and the target condition, and the types of studies you want, as well as obviously a background and rationale and objectives, uh, those folks at ACLS will then help you kind of uh, do a study selection assessment of the risk um, of methodology quality, uh, statistical analysis, as well as integration and, and sensitivity analysis um, in regards to uh, that review. Uh, we are kind of in the early stages as far as uh, this systematic review. We have come up with kind of a background and, and rationale, as well as the objectives uh, in looking at the um, available you know, literature, but it is pretty extensive, and um, we hope uh, to have uh, kind of the initial results of the systematic review for uh, next year's um, our research day. Um, kind of switching gears, um, there are kind of, it was kind of a two-phase project in a sense where, um, number one, we wanted to do a systematic review uh, of, of kind of the available evidence, but um, you know, for a lot of our glaucoma providers, it's also nice to kind of have a uh, kind of a handy sheet or quick and dirty uh, method of just assessing a lot of these patients in the quick clinical setting. Um, and certainly, you know, as PGY2s, we are always trained in, in the broad differential for optic neuropathy. And uh, with kind of the help of, of Dr. Sharaf Agunta, um, we developed uh, this uh, atypical optic neuropathy uh, kind of, in a, in a sense, like worksheet that just highlights kind of the different uh, types of optic neuropathies, the associated visual field uh, losses, onset, and risk factors. We're hoping to be able to disseminate this a little bit further in regards to um, just any general provider or glaucoma doc that would like it. Uh, certainly, a lot of what's on here is pretty basic. You get that in, in your residency training, but it's also nice to have that as just a quick reference in regards to you know, the decision to refer or not to refer. Uh, so these are my references. I would like to thank everyone for their attention and would be happy to have uh, any questions um, taken. I would like to uh, thank uh, the neuroophthalmology department and then especially uh, Dr. Shraf Agunta who's been very patient and uh, helpful in regards to uh, getting this project started. Awesome. No questions. Uh, I think Brian, did you raise your hand? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Not off the hook. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, great work, and thank you for working on this. This is a it's a big issue, um, and I think. You know, also an issue that's maybe increasing. I, I feel like we're getting a lot more uh, normal tension glaucoma patients than we used to. And I don't know if that's because of iPhones or not, but I think it is. I think it is true. And uh, it's just something that we face really often in in clinic. So this is super helpful. One of the reasons this subject came up in our morning report was because we we do see the sort of back and forth referral between glaucoma and neuroophthalmology. Uh, is, this, is this typical glaucoma or is this not? Do, how far do we need to go in working this up? Um, but specifically, what about genetic causes? And you know, of course, that's the big news in, in all areas of care these days. But um, I don't know that that's something that in optic atrophy and glaucoma that we really use enough. Because um, I think you can really potentially answer a lot of questions and halt a lot of extraneous workups if you've established that there is truly an underlying uh, genetic cause It'd be very helpful. Any further questions? Okay, so we go on. Our next speaker is Ashley Polsky. There she is. And she will talk about the incident glaucoma after periocular and intravitreal steroid injections claims-based analysis. And um, Ashley wanted uh, to become a horse veterinarian. And I know that Bob wanted to comment on this. Yeah. You have your, your mic? <laughs> yes. 
uh, traveled with Alan Crandall and I to Ghana a number of times, who did become an equine vet. And so I can put you in touch with her. Perfect. She'd probably like to work together. Maybe Networking. You can study glaucoma. And that sounds awesome. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry, I know I'm the last talk before lunch, so thanks everyone for sticking around. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And I'll start with just a, a bit of background. Um, so in recent decades, regional administration of corticosteroids via periocular or intravitreal injections has become in increasingly prevalent in the treatment of various ocular conditions. Periocular administration includes subconjunctival, subtenon, retrobulbar approaches, whereas intravitreal injections deliver the steroid directly into the vitreous chamber. And advances in technology have also led to the development of sustained release steroid implants, such as Ozerdex and Alluvian, which are injected intravitreally, and Redisert, which is anchored to the sclera and allows for prolonged release of steroid into the posterior chamber. Ocular hypertension and glaucoma are well-known potential complications of steroid administration, and in some cases even require topical or even surgical intervention to treat. Um, and this slide shows a very simplified schematic of the pathophysiology of steroid-induced glaucoma. But in general, uh, steroids are thought to interact with various enzymes and cytoskeletal components within the trabecular meshwork to cause increased aqueous outflow resistance and therefore elevated intraocular pressure. While many studies have demonstrated the association between steroid administration and intraocular pressure elevation, very few studies have actually directly compared the risk of glaucoma development between different types and routes of steroid injections. And additionally, no studies to our knowledge have utilized insurance claims data to investigate this topic. So the purpose of this study was to determine the incidence of new glaucoma following periocular and intravitreal steroid injections using a large insurance claims database and to assess the impact of various demographics and treatment characteristics on the risk of developing post-injection glaucoma. So in this study, we performed a 10-year retrospective review of the IBM market scan database. Um, and as just a little background of this database, um, it's a de-identified database, and it's one of the lo longest running and largest collections of privately and publicly insured patients, including more than 260 million individuals and containing both inpatient and outpatient uh, procedure and prescription drug information. So we searched this database for all patients who had received periocular or intravitreal steroid injections between 2011 to 2020. And in order to ensure that we were measuring new glaucoma development, we excluded all patients who had a prior history of glaucoma within two years before their first steroid injection. Uh, we also excluded patients under the age of 18 to ensure that we had an adult cohort for this study. Our main outcome measure was the development of glaucoma, which we defined as a new diagnosis of glaucoma or ocular hypertension. Uh, the initiation of IOP lowering drops, or laser or surgical glaucoma procedures. And we then used a series of Cox proportional hazards models to determine the risk of glaucoma development within five years after the first steroid injection. So a total of 50,112 patients received steroid injections in or around the eye during the study period. 26,459 patients did not have an adequate enrollment uh, period prior to their first injection, so they were excluded. Um, an additional 593 patients were under the age of 18, and then 3,904 patients had a prior history of glaucoma, so were excluded. So this left us with a final study cohort of 19,156 patients. Um, overall, about 26.8% of patients developed glaucoma within five years after their first steroid injection. And more specifically, 20.5% were newly diagnosed with glaucoma or ocular hypertension. 17.5% were started on IOP lowering drops. 
and about 2.3% required a laser or surgical procedure to treat glaucoma. Um, we did not find any significant association between age or sex and the risk of post-injection glaucoma development within this cohort. So this graph shows uh, the risk of glaucoma development represented by hazard ratios according to the steroid type and route of administration, which you can see listed along the bottom of the graph. And just to clarify, a hazard ratio of one indicates a lack of association, a hazard ratio greater than one suggests an increased risk, and then a hazard ratio of uh, below one suggests a decreased risk of glaucoma. Um, so we found that subconjunctival triamcinolone injections were associated with a significantly lower risk of glaucoma development compared to all the other types of regional steroid administration that we looked at, with 6.4% of patients being started on IOP lowering drops and only about 1% of patients requiring a laser or a surgical procedure to treat glaucoma. On the other hand, the Redisert intravitreal implant was associated with the highest risk of glaucoma development with over half of patients being started on IOP lowering drops and over 35% of patients requiring an additional laser or surgery to treat glaucoma. We also looked at glaucoma development relative to the total number of steroid injections received over time. And we found that the risk of glaucoma was significantly higher for patients who received more than one steroid injection. The largest increase in risk of glaucoma occurred after the third steroid injection, after which the risk of glaucoma development started to level off after four or more injections. So to summarize, uh, this study was the first to our knowledge to utilize a large claims-based data set to characterize the incidence and risk factors of post-injection glaucoma over a multi-year period. Um, and this highlights the potential for utilizing a large-scale uh, insurance claims data set like this to investigate population patterns in uh, steroid-related glaucoma development. We found that the risk of glaucoma development was particularly high for patients receiving intravitreal steroid injections and implants. Um, and previous studies have demonstrated that a high intraocular concentration of steroid is achievable even after just a single intravitreal injection of steroid, and that the medication can persist at significant concentrations for multiple months or even years for some sustained release implants. Um, so this could explain the higher incidence of glaucoma development in these patients compared to the subconjunctival and other periocular routes of administration. And again, the risk of glaucoma development was higher for patients receiving multiple steroid injections over time. And interestingly, the largest increase in glaucoma risk occurred after the third injection. Um, while this could be indicative of a cumulative effect of steroid injections on the risk of glaucoma development, I think this finding is also possibly reflective of the potential delay that can occur between steroid administration and subsequent IOP elevation, which can be as long as multiple months, according to some studies. Uh, we additionally found that the increase in glaucoma risk began to kind of level off following four or more steroid injections, which could be influenced by the fact that typically clinicians tend to avoid uh, repeated steroid injections in patients who demonstrate IOP elevation initially, which effectively prevents higher risk patients from receiving very large numbers of steroid injections. Uh, as we come to a close, I, I just wanted to highlight some of the more clinically relevant points of this study. Um, first of all, we showed that glaucoma is a considerable risk of periocular and intravitreal steroid injections despite these patients having no prior history of glaucoma or ocular hypertension, which I think is an important distinction to make. Um, because of a potential delay between initial steroid administration and the development of glaucoma, uh, it's also important to maintain long-term vigilance in monitoring for glaucoma in patients receiving repeated steroid injections, even if there's no IOP elevation after the first one or two injections. And finally, uh, having a better understanding of these risk factors for steroid-induced glaucoma could be really useful not only for providing individualized counseling for patients who are receiving steroid injections, 
but also for potentially determining uh, how closely these patients should be followed to monitor for glaucoma over time. Um, of course, there, there are some limitations that are inherent with uh, using an insurance claims database, including a pretty heavy dependence on provider coding accuracy, rather than having direct access to eye exams or intraocular pressure measurements. And in order to address some of these limitations, I'm, I think, like the fourth person to talk about this awesome database, but we hope to replicate our findings using the source uh, database, which, as you know, Dr. Stack is really closely affiliated with. Um, and this database contains over 220 million eye exam findings, which could provide us access to more specific IOP measurements that the IBM market scan database lacked. Um, and I'm currently in the process of putting together a research proposal for source so that we can take this next step. So here's a list of my references. Um, and I just want to especially thank Dr. Stagg, who's been an awesome mentor throughout this process, um, as well as the ARCS Foundation for funding my research over the past year. Uh, we also had a really incredible group of collaborators from the Duke Eye Center who uh, have contributed their time and their ideas to this project, so I'm really grateful for them. Um, I had the really fun experience of pre presenting this uh, project as one of the selected top posters for the uh, American Glaucoma Society meeting this year. Um, so I'm, <laughs> thanks. So I'm really excited to uh, submit this as a manuscript for peer review soon and continue my research next year as a PGY3. So thank you for listening. Happy to take any questions. Really nice work. Uh, did you look at any of the comorbidities that people have? Uh, I mean, not just migraine, of course, but uh, others like diabetes and, and other yeah. metabolic problems? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, <laughs> we did look at uh, patients with diabetes. We looked at a few of the, what's been previously reported in the literature as potential risk factors for steroid-induced glaucoma. So some of those included things like diabetes, um, I think like a family history of glaucoma, and then um, a history of PK as well. Um, I think the history of PK was the only one that seemed like maybe there was an association there in our cohort. Um, but as far as other metabolic problems, we didn't look too much into that. So that'd be an interesting thing. We, I'm so sorry, Dr. <laughs> <We did. laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a really good point. Thank you. Thank you. Quick question. Um, good job, Dr. Polsky. So since you guys identified like the risk factors and some of the different injections, like you said, the intravitreal injections, the sustained release, do you think there's any utility in like prophylactic SLT in these patients to prevent the onset of steroid induced glaucoma? Because I know it can treat it, but yeah, that's or if there's research out there about that? That's a really good question. I, I would have to look further to see if there is. I, I was just having a chat with Dr. Warasco the other day about how low risk SLT is. And she I know she's a huge fan of it. So, but that would be really interesting. I'll have to look to see if there are any papers on that. So I think you'd have a hard time insurance companies, even at a 50% incidence as a prophylactic measure. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, in my career, as I look back, uh, some of the most, many of the most tragic cases are steroid-induced glaucoma that have not been recognized where the treatment's been given by ophthalmologists and they don't recognize what's happened. And so just briefly, one, uh, a patient with, uh, you know, vernal keratoconjunctivitis, well-treated with steroids, nobody ever measured the pressure, finally came to me because they were worried about decreasing vision. And there was a steroid cataract, but both nerves were almost burned out. Pressure's 38, 39. This has been going on for years. Big malpractice suit. Mm -hmm. And correctly so. I mean, that that's, that's just shouldn't happen. Another one was a neighbor who'd had a corneal transplant, had uh, had a rejection. And uh, they keep, was told that it's getting better and better over time. But he said, my vision is getting worse and worse. I said, well, let's take a look. So I just came in to see him as a friend. You know, I actually brought him in over the weekend and his his pressure was extremely high. The nerve was burned out. 
Uh, and indeed, the cornea was clearing and the pressure just hadn't been checked. So we just, mm -hmm. just as all of us, if, if a patient is on steroids of any type, you just have to have those pressure monitored mm -hmm. and, and, and you have to make sure because in some cases with corneal pathology, it's hard to know exactly the pressures. You know, you just get everyone's like, take a look at that nerve and make sure you're okay. And, and both of these were tragic situations. And the glaucoma, sadly, is a disease that once the horse is out of the barn, you can't get it back. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of these at the VA too recently, just with like compliance with post-op visits too, who have gotten Osiodex and then no showed their follow-ups. And talking with the retina faculty there, they will sometimes not even offer Osiodex if they're not going to come for those post-op visits. So for residents, if there's any concern that they are not going to come back, like maybe talk about not doing it too. Yeah. Well, it's a double-edged sword too, because I mean, one of the points of the Osirdex is it's going to give you long-term, reliable treatment for whatever their underlying condition is. But then they're at high, higher risk if they have glaucoma. But uh, my question was, and I don't think that you could get at this at this with that particular database. But does um, a pressure elevation with topical or periocular steroids predict elevated intraocular pressure with intravitreal treatment? Um, I, I would doubt that people are going straight to intravitreal uh, without some of the other treatment options first. It, would that be helpful information? Yeah, and that's, that's a really good point because like looking at the, the Redisert group that I highlighted that had a pretty high rate of glaucoma development, I, I think you're right that probably a lot of those patients had some other form of steroid treatment prior to getting a prolonged or a sustained release steroid implant like that. Um, we did not specifically look at topical in in this scenario, but I imagine like it seems like some patients once they respond to some type of steroid medication, we kind of label them as steroid responders. So I, I would definitely be on higher alert if there was a patient who I knew had responded to like topical drops, and then yeah, Dr. Stag. Sorry, this, this glaucoma stuff just gets me excited. <laughs> yeah. But no, uh, Judith, I, I think that's an awesome idea. And I think we could look at that with the source database. Yeah. Um, some people believe that there's no such thing as steroid response, or I mean, that there is a steroid response, but it's not a unique thing to an individual. Like you're a steroid responder. Some people believe that you're, uh, that you have like underlying trabecular meshwork pathology. And so you're more susceptible to the, the steroid. And so it's not, it's not the fact that you're like a steroid responder or not. It's just you have underlying trabecular meshwork mm -hmm. disease. And so that, and then it's like a dose dependent thing. Yeah. So if you give enough steroid to anyone, you get a steroid response. Like yeah. IIH and minocycline, you know, yeah. like you have a susceptibility, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. A QI thing you could do would be, because this has been done before, is you could have in Epic a tickler to say this person has is on oral steroids this you know it may not sort of pass into your consciousness that the patient may be on oral steroids they because they've got arthritis or giant cell arteritis or something like that uh or they're on uh, topical steroids check the pressure yeah. and that's sort of thing that emr is really good at yeah that's a really good idea so we had a patient in the hospital who was receiving very high dose steroids and they're a pediatric patient and they complained of some vision changes and turns out their pressure was living in the fifties in response to their high dose steroids. I wonder sometimes how many like ocular hypertension or these undiagnosed patients with glaucoma were simply pediatric patients that received high dose long-term steroids without any eye exams. So maybe that could be a study as well. I was just going to highlight Dr. Lara Shell made a comment. She said, I do have a few patients, though, that seem to be able to get endless intraocular steroid injections and never have an IOP rise. Yeah. Okay, so for now, we are concluding. Uh -huh.